Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let's start with the session. It's called the Youth Summit, and when you look at the stage, you may wonder. But uh, <laughs> at the same time, it says it should be an intergenerational dialogue. And they say it nicely between experienced leaders and the brightest young minds. And I will ask my co-moderator, Lily, to explain a little bit more about the concept of the session before I ask the Under Secretary General, Mr. Lee, and the co-chair of the leadership panel, Mr. Vint Cerf, to make formal opening remarks. But over to you, Lily, as my co-moderator. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you are joining us from. And this is our uh, to our online audience. We know you're joining us and we're excited that you are online and joining us. And to you in the room, can I hear a cheer for everyone? A clap, a shout. Can we say, go youth? <laughs> right. So we know on this panel, we see what we call an intergenerational mix of what we call the seasoned leaders and the young bright minds. So I'm going to share with you what it is we are looking to do in this session today. For the Global Youth Summit, we aim to bring together some of the brightest young minds and seasoned leaders of today from around the world, fostering meaningful dialogue and collaboration between generations. So we are young and we have people who are also young at heart. By facilitating intergenerational open exchange of ideas, experiences and expertise, this summit seeks to chart a course towards a safer digital landscape for everyone. It would underscore the crucial significance of implementing sound digital policies, laying the foundation for a secure and responsible digital future. And at this summit today, we'll embark on an exciting journey of digital innovation, empowerment, and collective action to create a world where youth and seniors unite as architects of a better and safer digital tomorrow. So you're welcome, everyone, and I'll hand over to my co-moderator. Thank you, Lily. And with that, I invite Mr. Chinua Lee, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations, to give his address. Please, Mr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Well, uh, Good afternoon, the brightest the young minds are from the, around the world. Um, it is very, very delighted that to greet you, to meet you here in Kyoto, um, the 2023 the IGF Forum. Uh, this IGF Forum is a result of the year-long global collaboration between the youth IGFs from around the world. It has evolved organically from the dialogues held at the different regional IGFs, let us bond the continents, all the way from Finland to the Colombia, Australia, Nigeria, and now Kyoto, Japan. The issue you discuss, you address, are crucial in today's world, such as the mental well-being of the young people in the digital era, online human rights, cybersecurity capacity building, and the influence of the um, AI or artificial intelligence. The scope of this collective effort has underscored the commitment of the young people or the brightest young minds to creating a safer digital world, fostering dialogue and enhancing digital literacy and security for everyone. The digital age, as we all know, as we all witness, has ushered in tremendous opportunities and conveniences from the instant and the borderless communications to the access to the vast knowledge resources. But it has also brought about numerous challenges we can name it, such as cybersecurity, cyberbullying, online harassment, privacy the breaches, and the spread of the misinformation and disinformation. About one third of the global population, or upon the two six billion people, remain unconnected. Let us the serious phenomenon during our life with the majority from among the least developed countries and in the African region. Absolutely, more deliberate and sustained efforts are needed 
to achieve the universal and meaningful connectivity by 2030. As we grappled with these issues, it has become evident that young people, the brightest young mind, must have played a pivotal role in shaping the future solutions. The reason for this has, is twofolded. First, you, the brightest young minds, are most qualified among us to address these issues. You have grown up with digital technology as an integral part of the, your lives. Second, because you are not just the mere users of the digital technologies, you are the also creators and innovators. You also know its strengths, its weaknesses, and its potential. But the young people, the brightest the young minds, are not only on this journey alone. To best leverage your contributions, your, in, your engagement with other stakeholders is the key. A healthy intergenerational exchange of ideas can foster the mutual understanding and lead to the more effective strategies for the digital safety. Today, I'm so delighted to witness the realization of this vision. Seated around here are not only the youth from the diverse backgrounds, but also the esteemed senior experts, including diplomats, Le legislators and the cyber leaders. This presents a valuable opportunity for all of us to learn from the conference of experience and innovations. So that I hope that the, today's session will inspire commitments around the world to create an environment where the youth feel that their voices are heard their contributions acknowledged. They should be encouraged to take the lead in initiatives aimed at promoting digital literacy, cybersecurity, and responsible online behavior. I thank you so much. Thank you so much. We just had that on this Janita, um, advocating for an open, safe, and secure internet, and uh, just the recommendations we bring um, to bear in our conversations. We are not alone. Um, he just shared how there is a need for us to consider other people who are stakeholders in the conversation and also to um, work side by side to be able to realize our aims. So continuing in the same light, we want to hear an address from Mr. Vincent, who is a father of the internet and also a part of the IGF leadership panel. And he is not new to many of us. He's one of the people who's actually young at heart. The floor is yours. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I want to assure you that I was young once. <laughs> so you, know, you have every opportunity to, uh, to do many of the things that I've had an opportunity to do uh, in a new iteration. Uh, I just turned 80 years old this year, but I tell everybody I'm 50 years old in hexadecimal. Wow. And uh, that's my uh, technique for staying young. Um, First of all, one of the things you should appreciate is that the fundamental key to the internet is connectivity. That's what it was designed to do, connect things together all around the world. Everything should be able to communicate with everything else. You don't have to communicate. It's like a phone call. You don't have to answer the phone. You can hang up the phone. The computers don't have to talk to each other, but we want the technology to allow them to do that. Now, what are the consequences of having achieved that objective. By the way, this is the 50th anniversary of the design of the internet, which began in 1973. And so I've lived through every single one of those 50 years. Um, what are, one of the unintended consequences of uh, this connectivity is that we wanted to reduce the barrier for access to the sharing of and discovery of information. 
That's basically what we wanted to accomplish, and we did that. We haven't done it for everyone in the world, and part of your job is to help us get there to the additional people who are not yet online. But we've also discovered that just as there are harms in the physical world, there are harms in the online world. In the physical world, the social contract that we uh, often believe we have accepted and adopted says that your freedom is open until you get in the way of someone else's freedom. So for example, my freedom stops right here, just about you know two millimeters from his nose. I am not allowed to punch him in the nose. There might be times when I would want to do that, but, <laughs> but, but you know, his freedom is to be protected from that. And it's important for you to appreciate this, that the freedoms in the online environment need to be protected. And at the moment, they are at risk. We may have more freedom than we should have. We need to find ways of continuing to gather value from this online connectivity while protecting people from its potential harms. This is hard. Now, that's why it's important that you're young, because you're too young to know that you can't do that for some value of that. And believe me, when we were first starting the internet, we didn't know whether it was going to work either. Uh, and there were many uh, mountains to climb, uh, many challenges to overcome. And now there are more, and you are now part of that story. So the thing that I look to you to do as you talk about the internet and the applications that now ride on top of it, thanks to the World Wide Web and Tim Berners-Lee and others, is to figure out how we maintain the human rights that we want to retain, both online and offline, while at the same time protecting people from potential harms in the online environment. I don't have to tell you that part of the solution involves using this thing up here called your brain and applying what's called critical thinking to what you see and hear. This takes work. This is not free. The, all of the advantages and possibilities of the internet and online environment are not free. You have to pay a price, and that's to use your head. Mm -hmm. And so please, as you're thinking about how to revise this social contract to work in this global online environment, be aware that people have to learn how to think critically about what they see and hear. We have to give them some clues. We might have to help them discover where information comes from. There's a term for that, it's called provenance. There's transparency. Whose information is this? Why did they put this information online? Is there something they're trying to get me to do that I shouldn't do or don't want to do? We need to help people answer those questions, and you're the right team to do that. So I'll stop there, uh, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairman, uh, and excuse myself because I have another meeting I have to go to, but I am so glad that you're here. Those of you physically here uh, in Kyoto and those of you who are online, we need your energy and thinking and creativity to make this environment what we all hoped for 50 years ago. Thank you. In the name of all participants, I would like to thank you, Vint and Mr. Lee, for these inspirational remarks, and you're free to go with busy schedules. Thank you. With that, may we invite all the other speakers for this session to join us up on the stage. There may not be enough chairs up here yet. That doesn't matter. Then. Lily and I can stand and walk around, but there's enough chairs for... Oh, the chairs are coming. <laughs> okay, excellent. Excellent. I think in the interest of time, just sit wherever you like. Yeah. <laughs> Just 
go to the middle. We stay at the, the moderate stroke. Okay, just a few. Well, I think we do away with an introduction round of the names. We introduce you each time when we address the issue. I just follow the notes the secretary prepared. So the setting of the stage with current and next generation of experts and leaders cooperating mm. for a safer digital future. We have first to address the question, how can we effectively develop and enforce policies to safeguard the online privacy and safety of youth while promoting digital engagement and innovation? We have first Mr. Peter Marion from the European Commission. Please, Peter. Um, good afternoon, everybody, or uh, good morning or evening, indeed, for those uh, online. I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much for this opportunity. So I will try to uh, get straight to the point. Um, on the question of um, enforcing policies to safeguard uh, online privacy and safety while promoting the digital engagement. So first of all, um, I'd like to say that f at the European Union, the, the way that we are working on uh, digital transformation is what we call a human-centric approach. Human-centric approach meaning we put the individual at the middle of all our policies, not the state, not the companies. And of course, when we look at individuals, that includes then the youth. And in that respect, um, there, there's quite some uh, things that we do to focus on that part of uh, our society. So recently, the EU has adopted a joint declaration on digital rights and principles. Um, and it's important to state that this declaration actually has special attention to children and young people who should feel safe and be empowered. So uh, I invite you all to, to have a look at that declaration. There's even for the very young amongst, maybe not here, but elsewhere, there's even a child-friendly version of that declaration. Now, what does this mean in practice? So, um, the EU is currently working on the adoption of uh, what uh, one of our uh, legal instruments, it's a regulation and it's called the Digital Services Act. And the Digital Services Act, and I think you'll hear, hear probably quite a lot of it in the next month, it, for example, bans targeted advertising to minors based on personal data profiling. So. This is just to say that we go from these high-level principles to real uh, action at the lowest level. And this is possible, and it's happening. Um, now, apart from protecting through legal uh, instruments, of course, there is uh, the importance of working on skills and competences. And the previous uh, speakers already uh, mentioned this. I'd like to also underline the importance of critical thinking, which is a long-term, uh, let's say, process, uh, educational process. Um, but apart from that, there are also tools available which can support countries and states in their digital, uh, and let's say, in their educational systems. So, for example, the EU has uh, created a digi digital competence framework. It's a framework to think about digital competences in the educational system. And this system currently is also being uh, adopted by a lot of our partners worldwide. Apart from that, we are also working with our partners worldwide on their um, digital educational systems. <clears throat> for example, in Africa, we have a, a 100 million euro teacher training program ongoing. And we're also working, just to, to name a few, in, in, in Nigeria, in uh, Uganda, in Mozambique, in Jamaica, on, on all types of um, approaches to promote these digital skills. Um, and then I'll end, not take too much time <clears throat> just to say that apart from you know regulatory approach scaling and so on there's of course the whole important aspect of multi-stakeholder involvement and ensuring that the youth is also part of these uh, societal discussions and these regulatory approaches and so uh, the EU especially for example the, the DG where I work for DG INPA we have created a youth sounding board 
where um, youth can engage uh, with us. And for example, at the last uh, IGF in Addis Ababa, there was an engagement between our commissioner and uh, people uh, sitting on this youth sounding board. So thank you very much. Thank you for that. And now we turn to a youth perspective. We have Jenna Fang from Asia Pacific Youth IGF. Please, Jenna. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me and giving me this opportunity to address this such an important topic on this panel with everyone today. Uh, I will try to keep everything short and concise so we can save some time for all of us to discuss this topic at the open, um, open floor discussion. That's you know the most exciting part. So to begin with, I would like to look into the nuanced interplay between policy development and enforcement in safeguarding online privacy and safety, particularly for a younger generation. So in the world of online safety, crafting policy and ensuring their enforcement are two distinctive component yet fundamentally interconnected processes. Developing, developing policies without effective enforcement mechanism, it's like building a house without walls. Um, on the flip side, attempting to enforce policy without the right framework in place is like trying to cross a river with a bridge that's no solid foundation. A structure that that's, uh, you know, that meant to scramble and collapse eventually. So therefore, I think the effectiveness of policies in safeguarding online privacy and safety for youth hinge upon the sim simultaneous integration of both well-constructed framework and a vigilant enforcement mechanism. Otherwise, it would just be a pointless effort that leaves our young people vulnerable to many risks exposed on the internet. But what exactly constitute the right framework and who should take charge of defining and developing it? In my recent collaboration with a group of amateur policy researchers in Asia Pacific, um, we study different approaches to online safety policies and legislation in Asia Pacific and we found that, for example, Australia adopted a uh, more like industry coach, uh, code approach where, whereas in Singapore, uh, they lean towards a more government-driven policy. And so we, we found different approaches in different countries. And so the question remains, who should be determining what constitute the right framework? And my straightforward answer is that it should be a collective effort that involves everyone. Our ever-evolving cyberspace, particularly at the application and contents level, is predominantly driven by big tech. They governed and regulate these privately owned public spaces with policies that often designed it for the interests of their business. Yet, there are many layers to online safety with the discourse, especially among the youth. Primarily, we focus on the application and content level quite a lot, which it gets pretty myopic sometimes. So it's very important not to overlook the critical technical aspect that uh, underpinned, uh, that under online safety. To truly protect our young people, our discussion must be driven by global public interests that transcend national and local agendas. In order to achieve that, we need a multi, um, multi-stakeholder, multidisciplinary, and multi-level approach to establish international standard that might help different jurisdictions to establish their own framework to, uh, to enforce the policy to, and protect their younger generation. With that, we must engage everyone's voice, not only ours, but those who may have the knowledge and expertise to contribute to the process, but prehistorically might not be included in, um, in, in this space to achieve um, an inclusive approach. I think collaboration, collaboration among key stakeholder is in this domain is uh, paramount. Um, and as we democratize the process to ensure a diverse and inclusive um, representation of voices, empowering our younger generation with knowledge and tools to protect 
ourselves becomes very, um, it's, it's a key to afford success. Likewise, educating the parents and educator on how to safeguard their own children is equally vital. As a young professional that work at a top level domain, registry, who advocate for internationalized um, domain names and universal acceptance, I would like us to also acknowledge how powerful language can be as a tool for inclusivity. While English is often seen as a universal language, many of us in this room um, and online today don't speak English as a first language, myself included as a Cantonese speaker. So therefore, why is our internet so monolingual still today, especially um, at technical level? Um, this may have something to do with the legacy um, of the internet, and I will admit that I don't have the full comprehensive knowledge about that, but um, as someone that advocate for a more inclusive and diverse multicultural internet, I think that should be something we ev eventually explore as well. Sure. Lastly, let's remember that online safety isn't just about security, but also a preservation of privacy and digital freedom. Striking this balance is a challenge, but it's um, one that we must adjust collectively. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So we have the conversation moving on and we've had uh, from the perspectives of um, both Mr. Peter and Ms. Jenna how to approach this um, enhancing privacy uh, for all in, in a human-centric approach and also doing it with key stakeholders present. We want to continue the conversation and this time we want to ask how policymakers um, strike a balance. How can policymakers strike a balance between protecting individual privacy and ensuring cybersecurity measures are robust and effective in ever-evolving digital landscape? So how can we ensure that these are pretty much up to date, um, are protecting us as much as they can? And for this part, we're gonna have two speakers. The first is going to be Mr. Nicolas Fimarelli from the Youth Luck IGF. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lily. My name is Nicolas Fiumarelli. Hello, everyone. Today, I am here in place of Umut, who unfortunately had a collision with another session at the same time, but will hopefully join for the second part. Some of you may know me as the co-coordinator of the Youth Lack ICF and as an active member of the board of the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance. Uh, but beyond these roles, I, I represent a generation that has seamlessly woven its narrative with the digital tapestry of our times. A generation that understands the profound intersections of technology, privacy, and cybersecurity. So striking this balance between protecting individual privacy and ensuring robust and effective cybersecurity measures in 2023 is paramount, as Shena said. From the discussion held during the workshop two at the Youth Lack like ICF or the Youth Track, Several critical insights and strategies were highlighted. Uh, to say, it was emphasized in the workshop that cybersecurity awareness must be cultivated across all societal, all societal tiers. Uh, waving in cybersecurity education into school and university curricula, we are nurturing the generation that understand the nuances of online safety. So this should cover topics like uh, regular up software updates, formulation of strong passwords, the identification of the phishing attempts, and also importance of consistent data backup. Uh, so the workshop also underscored the importance of, of involving young people more actively in the cybersecurity matters, given their innate familiarity with the digital age. Uh, their insights can be invaluable opportunities like the mentorships, research supports, uh, dynamic coalitions, research competitions, hackathons, etc., can further refine their cybersecurity skills, right? So additionally, inviting them to engage in the policy discussions directly ensures that the younger generation perspectives are incorporated into these national cybersecurity policies, as we say. So the dual role of artificial intelligence and also quantum computing, talking about these advanced technologies that are related, uh, was the focal point of the discussion at the Youth Lack like ICF. While these technologies present groundbreaking protective tools, they also open the door to vulnerabilities. As we know, policymakers are encouraged then, per the workshops inside, to facilitate the national and international cooperation. Um, we, we have seen the prospects of, of cybersecurity treaty by the UN, were discussing the, also in the workshop, encouraging the st standardized practices and fostering these cybersecurity norms, but providing with a structured pathway to bolster the cybersecurity mechanisms, as we have seen. 
Uh, so this platform is good or uh, can act like as a nexus uh, for countries to exchange best practices, fortifying the global cybersecurity standard. But the workshop also brought to light concerns regarding the limited stakeholder participation, right? How to ensure that everyone, and, and this is all encompassing to, to everyone. So just for concluding, the, the insights from the, the youth track workshop two at the youth like ICF clearly indicate that while individual privacy remains a cornerstone, it shouldn't compromise robust cybersecurity. So the policymakers can thread this delicate balance through education, engaging more the youth, that is very important part, and embracing new technologies, promoting this international collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicolas. Um, so we see that the need for the balance, uh, first for privacy and security. I mean, it, I just came from a session where that was also discussed and parliamentarians were looking at it in very different aspects. Um, and now, because I mentioned parliamentarian, we are going to also a parliamentarian and a representative from um, the Malawian parliament, and that is Ms. Susan Dosi. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Susan Dossi. I'm a member of parliament from Malawi. I chair the media and ICT uh, um, committee of parliament in Malawi, as well as a member of uh, APNIC. Uh, I understand the digital era has many benefits, but some digital technologies has, have enabled uh, privacy to be violated. And uh, I believe that privacy is a fundamental right that uh, enables us to make uh, decisions as uh, policy makers our role is uh, legislation uh, representation as well as oversight um, on my uh, on the speaking on the um, uh, uh, policy makers uh, side i believe that uh, as policy makers what we can do is to make sure that we come up with uh, legislation uh, that protects our the individuals that uh, uh, we represent and uh, also make sure that we strengthen our oversight role because most of the times we uh, come up with laws but implementation comes uh, becomes a problem. So it is our role as uh, members of parliament to make sure that we uh, do our oversight role, making sure that the laws that we pass are being complied with. So um, and then uh, I take it also as a challenge that uh, uh, balancing individual privacy and cyber security on digital uh, world, it is a manifested uh, challenge and uh, that can only be achieved if we come up with legal frameworks, ethical, uh, through ethical principles, technological advancement, as well as uh, making sure that uh, uh, we do, uh, as, as, as youth, uh, we engage them and make sure that we, 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 we engage in conversations whereby we are able to discuss and see how we should progress. Because um, I believe that uh, cyber security is key in this uh, digital era. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now let's turn our attention to social media platforms and ask the question, should there be more effective governance of social media platforms, including algorithm-based moderation to shield young users from cyberbullying and online harassment? And first we have Mr. Christopher Painter, President of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise Foundation Board. Christopher, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, and it's wonderful to be with all of you. I've supported the youth and IGF moment, uh, movement uh, and, and groups from the beginning. And I, I should say, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm a youth emeritus, I, I view. Uh, I, I was youth, like uh, Vince said, I was young once, like you, and, <laughs> and you have lots of opportunities before you. But I, I recall um, now, back in 2012, so a while ago, they had this big uh, meeting about the future of the internet uh, called the London Process in London, not surprisingly. And they had the uh, two forums. They had a youth forum that was separate from the main forum. And I remember at the end, the person uh, who was speaking on behalf of the youth forum came and spoke to the main forum and said, I don't know why you old people keep talking about the internet. It's where we live. And I think that is exactly, it's only become clearer over time that that really is where many people are living their lives, their social interactions, etc. So when we're talking about these issues of content moderation, it really uh, really goes to the theme that we've talked about, balancing uh, your ability to use the technology, balancing your right to privacy, ba balancing your other human rights, not just privacy, that's one of many human rights, and we talked about that this morning in another session, how do you make sure you achieve those basic human rights and protect things like free speech and association, while at the same time achieving security, and this is not an easy thing to do. So, 
on the one hand, should we have more content moderation, et cetera? My, my view is yes, but we have to do it in a smart way because at the same time, too often we see, particularly in certain governments around the world, more repressive governments as they look at this, they use that as a proxy to then restrict speech, restrict content they don't like. And we've seen this, you know, even now uh, in the UN, they're negotiating a cybercrime treaty. And you see the debates in that cybercrime treaty negotiations, which I've been to, and I'm a former, you know, I, I've been doing cyber now 33 years. I was a former prosecutor, then I was our first cyber diplomat, I was at the White House, and now I'm in civil society, so I've seen all the different aspects of this. And I'd say that these tensions are not new, but they're, they're bubbling up more and more when we think about how do we do the regulatory um, uh, approach, for instance, to social media. How do we encourage best practices? Because you don't want to lose why the internet is created, its real strength, to allow that free expression of ideas uh, among everyone, including youth. So yes, we want to protect youth, but we don't want to use that as a proxy by governments to have a broader agenda which, uh, again, uh, goes after content they don't like. Uh, I should say my organization, the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, is a worldwide um, uh, platform for cyber capacity building. We have about 60 countries, uh, 200 total uh, groups that are part of it, both civil society, industry, a real multi-stakeholder approach, and I think that's really important. Uh, one of the things that we've done recently um, is we have various working groups in, so in, in cybersecurity. One is on uh, working group D on um, awareness and skills. And uh, that group has just issued a report uh, or um, uh, had a report come out that talked about the, um, you know, education. And this was by, um, uh, by the University of Kent that did this. It's pre-university cybersecurity education, a report on developing cyber skills amongst children and young people that just came out in February of last year. And I think that helps try to set the, the tone for this. How do we make sure we, we mix these in an appropriate way? So it's not an easy topic, certainly. Um, the, the final thing I'd say, and I, I look forward to the interaction as well, is that um, in this area, my experience when I was a diplomat, when I was a prosecutor, when I was at the White House, in all these different roles and now, is there's tremendous opportunity for the people in this room to actually make a difference. Unlike many other areas of policy where everything is set, you have talking points, there's not much wiggle room, you know, it, it's been boiled down for years. Even as a young person in these various agencies, whether they be in the government or in the private sector, you have much more influence than I think you do in other areas because it's, the policies are still developing, the, the debates are still alive. So I encourage you to be involved in all those debates and, and I think it makes us all stronger for it, certainly in my group, we try to reach out, make sure we have that diversity of opinion that includes yours, because these issues really are going to determine the future for all of us, and they're not easy issues. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that, Christopher. Can we now have a youth perspective from Ms. Ihita Gangavarapu from the Youth India IGF, please. Right. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure, pleasure to be here um, to um, you know, to address and talk, give my perspective on something so critical and pressing at the moment. Uh, I'm Ahita Gangavarapu, I'm the coordinator of India Youth IGF. Um, so to answer your question, oh yes, without a doubt, we need effective governance of social media platforms to ensure that there is um, safety and there's trust um, and uh, security when um, vulnerable groups, especially especially young people, when they're navigating the online spaces, so to shield them from cyberbullying, from harassment, and exposure to harmful content. Um, you know, with more and more users coming in online, there is a lot of a tremendous increase in the activities that are happening online, and, it, and the sheer volume of data itself, right? Interventions from humans to moderate the content is quite challenging. And if you see, uh, most platforms, from my experience, have a reactive moderation mechanism, wherein once the issue is reported, moderation happens, right? So coming from uh, a tech background and having worked with a little bit of algorithms myself, um, I think that a proactive mechanism is what is required when it comes for flagging uh, moderation, um, removal of harmful content online uh, by social media platforms. And this is where I think algorithm moderation will come into place. Taking down content 
uh, of course, uh, does sound like censorship of our free speech and rights online. So it's important to ensure transparency in terms of the guidelines that the social media platforms are putting forward, the principles that they are following, and making sure that proactive moderation could be considered to be con conditional to situations. Um, formal reporting structure of the platforms uh, for those who's being, who, who are being bullied and harassed, um, you know, and there should be a mechanism for collecting evidence, and uh, there should be a helpline which is accessible and easy to use uh, by those who are experiencing uh, these aspects. And not just the platform, right? Even at the national level, um, you're looking at legislation across all platforms. So, for example, in India, that's where I belong. Um, under the IT Act, there is a requirement to have a grievance officer. A very important aspect here is to note the um, role that awareness plays, both in terms of a young person who is maybe being a bully without realizing or realizing, and for someone who is experiencing bullying. And, and so in this regard, it's really important to ensure sensit uh, sensitivity in identifying what is a healthy debate, what categorizes as bullying, what categorizes as harassment, what personal details should not be um, you know, disclosed. Um, this at the platform level, but also at an educational awareness at a school level. So in terms of my recommendations, I'm looking at awareness, looking at legislation, effective legislation. Uh, for platforms, we're looking at proactive measures um, using algorithms, uh, access control mechanisms, age-appropriate content. And all of these things, uh, these requirements, are not uh, have to be at the design level itself, the platform level. They have to be inherent in it. And they have to be inbuilt as functional requirements. Um, so thus, without a doubt, I would say that youth need to be protected and empowered for them to safely and meaningfully access the online space. Um, and I think all of us sitting in the room today have a role to play in ensuring so. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So our speakers have um, shown us what the struggle is right now for people to um, enjoy or maximize the use of social media and also a way to protect so much said that it gets to the good point where we are not censoring. And that is really important and I, I hear how we say that it's, it's, it, it, we require many things coming into play. Um, effective policies, we require um, education that's widespread and all of that. Now we are moving from the conversation to what role do we play? And I think uh, Ahita hinted it in her final words that it behoves us all to do something. And what exactly can we do? So the question I'm going to ask now to our next speakers um, is, how can young people actively participate in shaping cybersecurity policies and governance frameworks, ensuring their voices are heard in the decision-making process? And I'm going to start first with Ms. Marin Capicolo, who is um, with the Idly Youth IGF and also the ISOC Youth Standing Group. So, Varinka, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lily. Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, to the speakers for setting the floor for, uh, for this discussion. Uh, my name is Veronica Piccolo. Uh, I'm a youth IGF coordinator for Italy, but uh, some, some of you might know me uh, as chair of the Internet Society Youth Standing Group. Uh, it's a group that uh, mainly engage uh, young people um, globally uh, with a big presence from, um, from in Africa and uh, Latin, uh, Latin America. Um, and uh, we have a solid experience in uh, youth engagement, trying to empower them uh, to, you know, uh, take the floor in uh, policy uh, making uh, discussion. Um, in this regard, I will quote from my colleague, uh, Yao, Yao Amevi Sosu from Benin, uh, when I say that the lack of meaningful inclusion of youth voices in decision making, especially with regard to how existential threats are tackled, leads to what he called intergenerational disconnection. There is a lack of understanding between generations, a conflict over priorities, and on how to achieve long-term progress that benefit future generations. This is true for how, young, uh, for how current leaders tackle climate change, AI-driven existential threat, and how they frame the response to cyber attack and cyber criminality. 
and in a world that uh, is more and more globally connected, but is at the same time um, faces uh, the same old, uh, how to say, geopolitical tension. It is concerning also the lack of ICT experts in times where cyber threats are weaponized against civil society. And uh, in many countries, uh, there is also a lack of expertise uh, and basic cybersecurity framework. And the solution starts from the major investment in youth education and youth involvement and engagement. I could share some of the best practices we have in Europe, but I'm from a privileged country, and I cannot turn my head uh, the other way when I say, uh, when I, I saw some of uh, my valuable colleagues from the global, global South who could talk firsthand uh, about barriers to youth participation, they had to miss their flight uh, and accommodation because their visa was, not, was, re was rejected. So the fact is that even in 2023, being born in a given geographical area determines the chances that young people can shape their own careers into the ICT industry and their ability uh, to play an active part in the local global community. Being born and raised in a certain countries of the global south brings about substantially less possibility than those available in many other parts of the world. But there are a lot of talented people there and their project is contained in this book. So this book will be presented on Thursday and it contains all, um, all the interviews from people, especially from uh, Africa, um, about the work they do into the internet governance space. You can see the interviews and some QR code to the live interviews. But beside this, I would like also to share a four con concrete proposal that the youth community of the Internet Society included in the position paper on the Global Digital Compact that we propose to overcome barriers to youth participation. The first is to promote higher education and facilitate cross-continental exchanges in, I in ICT degree courses. A low number of young people leave their country to study in the European Union and in the United States, but they are fortunate enough to be able to afford that. Many others don't have that opportunity and they don't get through the visa application. Secondly, we need to adopt a more granular approach. We can keep talking in the same terms about youth participation and youth engagement when it concerns issues stemming global north young people and global south young people. Young people from low-income and marginalized community do not benefit from equal access to the technology and infrastructure needed to fully participate in the digital economy. This impaired, impaired their participation on equal footing and influence and the ability to influence the global agenda. Private business should invest and support youth-led digital activism projects and mentorship programs to connect young people with professionals in the business and digital skill building programs that target youth in marginalized areas. Lastly, it is necessary to mainstream youth issue into the development agenda by recognizing young people as one of the key stakeholders and create special consultation processes that include youth representative and organization in order to allow them to participate in decision-making processes and make sure the young perspective are taken into account and considered. I'm aware that these are my, some of these points might be, um, how to say, um, bold, but we need to invest more in young people because that means also investing more in the future generation, the future leader and future professional in the internet governance space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica. A round of applause for you.
Thank you for amplifying the work of young people around the world. And now we head out to Miss Paula Pinha, who uh, works with Netflix. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lily. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak on this panel, uh, which I think has the potential of being one of the most impactful ones uh, of this, this week of events. Um, I, I mean, when you think about connecting and sort of how to influence policy making, and I'm not going to focus just on, on digital security or cybersecurity, just cyber policy, digital policy as a whole. Um, there are lots of opportunities now for engaging and influencing those discussions. Uh, you know, there's fora like this. Uh, I know other international organizations, the Internet Society, all of them have youth groups, and I highly encourage everybody to get involved because those are being very influential when governments and companies are looking at the future of policymaking in this area. Um, certainly governments, when they are um, legislating, when they're regulating, you know, they, uh, today there's a, a big push for transparency in those discussions. Uh, getting involved, contributing to those discussions, participating in the dialogue is, is an important uh, part of that, and, and I encourage you all to get involved as well. Um, but I wanted to touch, you know, having the benefit of being the last sort of speaker here, uh, touch on a, on a few of the ideas that were discussed by uh, my fellow pa panelists. Uh, you know, we heard a lot about connectivity and sort of how that's the foundation of the Internet and how we can't dismiss it. We heard about freedom of expression, uh, we heard about the internet in which you all live, in which we all live. Um, and we need to be recognized that in order for all of that to happen, in order for all of that to allow you to participate in these discussions, for you, for you all to allow, to have, allow you all to have a voice in these discussions, we need to make sure that the internet remains free and open the way it's been until now. Um, you know, and, and as we are sort of, as Veronica mentioned, we are, uh, facing this conflict of priorities and we don't know which area to focus in and do we talk about this issue or that issue, connectivity and uh, openness of the internet is a basic issue that we all should be aware of. Um, today, the internet functions very much in a way that you all, we all, the users, get to pick the winners and losers and we get to decide which content we access and of course, we need to apply critical thinking and judgment and there's a lot that can be done there in terms of digital literacy to um, identify the right information. But the information is there, and we are able to choose the products and services and the information that, at the end of the day, will influence discussions. And if we start inserting artificial filters into which conversations get access, and which conversations you all get access to, and which uh, products and services we all get access to, the more we start limiting the types of services that are available to us, then those, that dialogue shifts completely. So I encourage us all to, when we're engaging in policy making in, in, in forums like this and in, with governments, we keep in mind that basic um, connectivity is the, the key to all of the discussions that are happening on the internet and we need to push that that remains as it's been, uh, open, free and you know, easily accessible to all. And then we can get into the, the conversation of how to make it accessible to all, which is a whole other set of issues. But without that basic openness, I think the conversation shifts completely. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we have finished our round of speakers on the panel, and we open the discussion to the floor. There are <coughs> two microphones in the room. I would suggest please just queue up behind the microphone, and we can take it in turns. So there are two microphones in the room. Just stand up, stand behind the microphone, and we take it in turns. You were the first, okay, you get started. Just, if you want to say something, go behind the microphone and then you take it in turns. Thank you, everyone. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ananda, I'm from Nepal, for the record. So, thank you so much, Vero, for such a nice thing and all the guests. So, I represent from Nepal and Asia Pacific. So, my point is, youth, we, it is a youthful uh, session and we are all youth. We are the biggest stakeholder of the internet today. And still, in the regional and national level, we don't have secured space to actually chip in into the policy discussions, policy making space. Being the biggest stakeholder of the internet, we have to actually capacity building kind of thing uh, from our national initiatives and regional initiatives so that youth can get the seat into the policy making, uh, which is really, and we have a lot of youth leaders 
here in this Youth Summit. And I encourage myself and all youth leaders that we have to work hard so that youth can be represented in the policy making space and maybe we can uh, work more diligently to make internet open, accessible and affordable. Thank you. <laughs> so I would suggest that we shift from microphone to microphone. Now we go to this microphone here and please introduce yourself. All right, thank you. I'm Levi Siansege from Zambia, Zambia Youth IGF, as well as the Internet Society Zambia chapter. I have two questions. One, I think, directed towards, I've uh, forgotten the name of the man, but I think he was talking about uh, security related to the internet. And then one, I think, I'd like to get a comment from Veronica and Ahita. Uh, that the first question is around security. We've noticed that there's been an increase in AI. To some extent, it can be a, th a, th a threat, but also it's, I think, one of the great tools to initiate development. But by observation, there's been a bit more of curtailing the use of AI. Let me give a case example where in certain universities, it's prohibited to use AI with regard to academic writing, when in the actual sense, it can be an effective tool to enhance learning uh, among the youths. Now, youths are among the big adopters of the internet, as we can all see, right? But if we are bringing in regulation around AI that inhibits its effective usage, then how do we navigate around the balance between AI usage as well as academia and any other related uh, tech development to ensure that internet technology is futuristic, but also ensuring that there's security? That's number one. The second part of it is how do we enhance uh, internet adoption in the global south. A case example is, uh, I, I love the fact that there's satellite technology to increase uh, connectivity, but so far it's been observed that it's actually very costly, and majority of people that are found in digital divide spaces cannot afford the conventional internet service provider's fees. But satellite technology, which is supposed to be helpful in creating a digital uh, inclusion society is proving to be a bit costly. How then do we balance satellite technology with existing internet service providers infrastructure to create digital inclusion? Uh, I raise my case, thanks. Thank you. In the interest of time, I suggest that the panelists at the end, we give them a round to react to the comments. And we have a count quite a long line there with about so in the interest of time, again, can you keep your remarks as short as possible? And again, we shift from one microphone to the other, so the next speaker will be over there. Please introduce yourself. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Emmanuel Vitus from Togo. So my question is directed to the MP. Uh, I will not actually uh, stress over the challenges that were raised. Uh, my question is for those who are already connected, those youth who are already connected, what are the progressive legislations that those policymakers, like the MPs in Africa today, are putting in place to minimize the risk of the use of social media? Because it's a main concern today for the youth who are connected. We are actually fighting to connect more. But what kind of progressive legislation are we putting in place to limit the risk of the use of social media on the continent? Thank you. Next speaker. Uh, hello, thank you for the, the panel. My name is Laura, I'm from Brazil. I'm a mentor at the Youth Brazil for IGF. And my question is, uh, internet governance is one of the few fields where the youth have a seat at the table. We have in the Internet Governance Forum, we have a youth track, we have the national programs, we have internet society programs. And uh, so we have this structure built and uh, a little bit consolidated. However, uh, the process that you all describe it uh, in, uh, about cyber, cyber security, about artificial intelligence, uh, they reveal a kind of a process of forum shifting in internet governance where decisions are being made on other places outside of these traditional spaces. How can we make sure that the youth has uh, a seat at the table and the tracks and institutional recognition on those other spaces? How can we take what we have here uh, to other institutional spaces that are more prominent right now? 
Thank you all. Thank you so much. So we we'll go back to this microphone and to you, Emilia. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Emilia zalewska czajczyńska I work for the Polish Research Institute NASC, and I also have the pleasure to be UFIGF Poland coordinator. So I wanted to ask you a question, but I believe that looking on how many questions we'll have, it will be just an issue to be put in the air. Uh, because what uh, we could heard uh, today in all these brilliant inputs by speakers is that a lot of questions about balance, balance between privacy, between human rights, and between cybersecurity, between protection, protection of minors. Uh, so what I wanted to bring up is the particular case that there's a lot of discussion around today, encryption like we could observe different tendencies from the, uh, on the one hand, we've got more and more legislation proposals to protect young people, especially the minors more for, from, for example, sexual abuse. And on the other hand, we talk that encryption enables human rights, enables privacy. It is crucial to be kept, not to uh, be omitted in order to detect bullying, to detect um, the sexual abuse of minors. So uh, what I think it is an important issue, important example of the specific issue when this balance is needed between the privacy protection, freedom of speech protection and other human rights, and at the same time, uh, the cybersecurity in the scope of protecting the youngest ones from the abuse. Thanks. Right, so now to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm Ibrahim Mohamed Mohamed from Nigeria. I work for National Information Technology Development Agency. My question is, uh, like, the, we have, I notice, we, all, we can all not notice there is a gap that is keep becoming wider and wider, which is trust between the policy makers and the youth participation. Uh, when it comes to, uh, because even my sister, she has been enforcing, 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 because of data privacy, uh, security, and transparency. How do you think we can bridge such a gap because it keeps increasing and becoming more wider? Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to impose a two minutes time limit to ensure that we keep the time. Now the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. My name is Franka. I'm from Germany. My question is really, we talked a lot about youth participation, about social media platforms, and one thing I was always wondering, there are existing platforms in social media platforms, like oversight boards, who give input for civil society. For example, Meta has the uh, oversight board, which is about free speech. I just checked their website. They're really pr proud to have 50% women, and there's not a single person under the age of 40. So I was wondering if it's <coughs> not possible anymore to have a woman, like men only, oversight board or panel. Why is it still possible for social media platforms to have an adult only panel? So this would really be a first step, not over the government area, but really about the platforms and and companies itself to bring in youth. So this is my question to everyone who's here from a big company, like why are you not including us directly? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right, now your, your turn. Thank you everyone. My name is Ahmad Karim, I'm from UN Women, um, working on online gender-based violence. And uh, my question is related to the internet governance and how far the youth are in the ladder of the governance, where it's the leadership of the internet is still with private sector. And that conversation with policymakers who, yes, they were once youth, but they have no idea of the reality of young people life at the moment. So there is a huge gap between policymakers and private sector. And with the youth are not included in that conversation. And in practice, they are way far behind and being part of the decision making. So I wonder if like you see an opportunity that would come, especially for you know how far distance the use from the global south and being in the conversation that is led by the major private sector companies and the internet governance, which is way far from the global south and young people. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we'll go to you too. Okay. 
Hello, it's Ma from North Africans, IGF. Uh, I want to talk about the awareness in privacy. I think there is a, the main point in privacy is uh, awareness. Uh, uh, increasing awareness is a very important thing in, about the privacy and uh, online harassment. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, what is the main project to do in this, in this point? about increasing our awareness, and what is the role uh, of sales? Thank you. Your turn, Manu. Uh, thank you. I'm Manu. I'm from Brazil, and I represent Instituto Alana, which is an organization that defends child's rights. So my question is a little structural. We're talking a lot about participation, but what about the effects of unemployment and the lack of time, money to participate, and I would like to know if there are regulatory experiences that actually create the institutional framework so that you allow for effective participation, because although we have a lot of youth here, nor normally the process is very hard uh, to participate. You have to have internet access, you have to go through a course, so it's very hard for the reality of a lot of people to go through the steps to be able to do advocacy on this issue. So how do we amplify this kind of possibility of effective participation, thinking about especially income, well-being, and time to participate? Thank you. Our question queues are closed now, so we'll take you, um, and then that's, that's the, line, the queue, and no new ones will be added. Okay, um, thank you. Um, this is Jasmine Ko. I'm from Hong Kong, I'm from a uh, technical community. So um, I actually have a, a, a case, a personal case to share. Um, so actually in Hong Kong, there was a rising number of um, cyber, you know, like cyber crime uh, related to, so like the thing is like um, my Hong Kong ID, my I identical number was being um, uh, stolen. And then uh, the, you know, like the criminal that use my uh, info personal information to um, uh, to do um, you know like uh, some some kind of uh, phone scam, and um, I was I. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually a little bit shameful to say that, but then um, the, the fact that is um, the police force, like they were trying to, you know, like warn me about like um, the, this is the things that was happening. But in the background, to give you some background, it's actually Hong Kong have been implementing something similar with China. So like when you register for a phone number, you need to use your real name and also identical number. And, but at the same time, the entire system did not cover that there is a leakage and gray area that the criminals could be could be able to use um, mine, like each of your personal, um, you know, like identical number or your phone number to commit crimes. So this is a problem, like being vulnerable in this case. So, um, oh, instead of just, you know, feeling my capacity on how to be more careful, you know, read all the terms when I have to click on I agree, you know, whenever it comes up, or like how, how would you, um, you know, advise us to, you know, to behave or whatever the system. I feel like it's not just a single person or youth problem, but I feel like it's also a systematic problem. Mm -hmm. So I, I would love to hear about your advice on this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Hi everyone, my name is Miriam Hart. I'm a recent graduate from Stanford University and a Gen Z technologist. My question is uh, targeted towards the parliament members and policymakers. So something that's really important about this issue in particular when it comes to digital governance is that it's a very technical problem requiring a lot of technocracy to be involved. And when you have a very technical problem, the technologists and the experts usually work for big tech. And what I found is that a lot of auditors in governance like the EU parliament actually audit people that come from these big tech companies to make these policies in place like the EU Digital Act. And so my question is how do you get good technologists to work for the government when they're not being paid the same kind of salaries that they are getting paid for for big tech. Thank you. Thank you. We're going down to one minute. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Naza Kirama, and uh, I, I work with the Internet Society Tanzania chapter and also Tanzania IGF and co-founder of the Southern Africa Regional School on uh, Internet Governance. I think um, uh, there, is, there is a huge problem. I just wanted to make a comment on the issue of uh, engaging young people. Uh, I think the issue has been engaging instead of inviting. Uh, there is a difference between engaging and inviting because when you engage, it's just you engage for the purpose of. But when you invite young people to be able to participate they will be able to, uh, you know, uh, to contribute 
their fair share of, of, of the digital future. So I think uh, uh, my advice to young people who are in the room, do not wait to be engaged. Invite yourself on the table so you can discuss these issues that are for you now, because this tendency of saying young so, people are the future. Yeah. Uh, young people are not the future, they are now. Thank you. If I may say, thank you. Absolutely, the floor is yours now, thank you so much. Thank you very much, my name is James, I'm from Cameroon. Uh, some of our lawmakers, or better still, our countries have exhibited a concerning level of complacency. I believe it is imperative for our legislators you know, to establish an environment that respects the rights of young people who are, who are aspiring to be, present, to be present in arenas where their future is being determined. Now, to achieve this, I think lawmakers could consider enacting legislation that ensures due respect for embassies and, you know, their functions. I think the NPs could, I think the, the MP could throw more light on this if anything is being done to, towards this, you know, perspective. Thank you so much. Now, the floor is yours. Oh, um, thank you so much. Um, I'm Ethan from uh, Hong Kong. I'm the Delft Ambassador of One Pile Foundation. So just a very short question. Um, so we have just talked about how, um, how uh, should we put uh, effective government governance to shield um, young users on social media. So I just wanna ask how, how effective are the current governance and uh, moderation practice been uh, in um, mitigating the um, cyberbullying and online harassment on social media platforms. And that's all, thank you. Thank you so much now to you. Thank you. Namaste everyone, this is Vivek Silwal from Youth ICF Nepal. So while there are an uh, ample amount of youth initiatives that are going in and it's quite successful in terms of creating awareness, but I have a question, are we really doing enough? With that, my question is, we need to build or empower community rather than empower individuals. And one of the major challenges I believe is the ample amount of information for youths in awareness. And with this, I want to emphasize including internet awareness, case studies in academia level from schools, lower sec sec secondary to higher secondary and colleges level. And awareness and safety in this place is quite essential because we are envisioning a safer future tomorrow. And even local and regional youth initiatives should emphasize a part in cre creating those programs. And deliberate considerations are required for the academic sector from basic level. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. My name is Terry. I'm also from Hong Kong. Um, I would like to draw a question about cyberbullying. Um, as we know that youth is one of the most active, but also the most passive one regarding to the internet. So how can we ensure youth is empowered enough to maximize themselves and benefits to, and benefits to themselves by using the internet, but at the same time, they will not be very vulnerable and overwhelming by the overload message mass uh, media. Um, like I'm from Hong Kong, over 50% of teenagers have suffered from cyberbullying as well as they don't know how to deal with the situation. And also 50% of people, of youth, of teenagers, they as, a, uh, they as a bystander, they don't know how to react, how to respond to this cyberbullying. So how can we deal to this situation and provide a more efficient practice? Yeah, I would like to know more about this question. Thank you. Thank you. The floor is yours. Yeah, uh, first of all, I would like to read a comment from the online participant. Uh, he is uh, Ray from the Bangladesh, who is also the vice chair of the Bangladesh UIGF. Uh, his question is uh, to the moderator and speaker. Uh, there is a large number of use are under the digital device and out of the connectivity. What is your plan to include and connect you in the mainstream across the globe? That is a comment came, came in from the Bangladesh uh, remote hub, uh, UIGF. And then I would like to uh, share my comment regarding to, uh, 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 from the U perspective regarding to the, uh, to our safety and 
uh, internet, uh, our involvement in the internet government. Uh, first of all, I think meaningful participation and the, our self-deliver engagement in this community is very important for everyone. But on one hand, the challenges are like Bronica said, uh, uh, said like we have lots of challenges uh, in terms of the financially, of course. That's why I would like to mention that we also need the support from the every kinds of the government, like uh, Japanese government, who are supporting to get visas. So uh, we will be very happy to see uh, continued support to the young people for uh, 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 to get the visa to travel to the Thank events you. like this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. The floor is yours in one minute. Thank you. My name is Sarah Naudi Ayu from Ghana Communication Technology, and also a member of Ghana Youth IGF. Uh, my question is, is there a way pornographic ads can be banned from advertising on the World Wide Web because we have most of our kids connect, connected on the internet just so that when they are, they are doing that, we know that they are safe. So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now the floor is yours. Hi, my name is Boris and I'm from Hong Kong. And my question is targeted towards policymakers. My question is, how can we ensure that new internet policies do not limit the ability of youth in accessing valuable internet resources, as some governments restrict the ability of youth in accessing certain websites, platforms, or resources? Thank, Thank you. you. Over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Nadia Wusu. I'm from Ghana. My question is on the declaration of the future of the internet. I wanted to know what the UG, um, youth IGF stance is on the declaration, because the declaration represents a political commitment by various stakeholders, including the US State Department and the U EU Commission on advancing a positive vision for the internet. I wanted to know what the youth IGF is doing to spread awareness and to make sure the principles are inclusive of youth, marginalized groups, and women and girls. Thank you. And our last speaker. Hi, everyone. Sorry for the voice. <laughs> I am Carla Braga, and I am come from the Amazon region. I am from the Amazonian Youth Corporation for Sustainable Society. Uh, development. Also, I am a youth mentor for the Brazil delegation. And uh, I just feel that this discussion was a little far from my reality. Not just because I come from the global south, especially in the Amazon region, where you are fighting for survive, because we are feeling uh, with the most intensity the impacts of the pollution, of the climate crisis, and bio biodiversity loss. So I was thinking, how can we discuss about how to make this space safe for the youth if we don't start discussing with so much energy how to make this space safe for the environmental too? You know, uh, science, the internet, it's for young people. And uh, talking about the climate crisis, it's also speaking about how we can preserve the young people and how we can build uh, a space that is safe for this person too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now over to you, Mr. Marcos. Well, we have lots of food for thought and not much time left. So my suggestion is a very simple one. I give each one of you one minute to react to whatever you want to react to. You start, Nicola. <laughs> yes. yes, very short comment. The, with the ICF 2023 empowering all people them, it is clear that real empowerment needs a, a safe digital space. You mentioned all um, the lesson from the youth track says that there is a need for built-in digital safety from the start, right? It's like having, braking, uh, having brakes in a car. You don't need to learn how to stop. The, the brakes do for you. So issues like online bullying show why this is crucial. And true empowerment means the internet is safe by default. So there are a lot of research about it, making it uh, open and secure for everyone. So. This, this will be a thing work for governments, tech experts, users, private sector, and, and uh, for, for achieving the ICF 2023 vision, right? Okay. Um, so um, I have a few questions actually, uh, but I will try to be very like uh, tweeting, or oh, now it's X, no? Um, so uh, there was a, a question about the inclusion of youth in the global south, and especially when um, not 
able to be connected online. Indeed, this type of forum needs you uh, to be connected online. If you don't have internet access, you cannot actually uh, engage in any way. So that's a structural problem. But uh, I would advise uh, the person who asked a question to connect with Ananda. Uh, he, he has done a lot of uh, good work uh, with the community network, so maybe you can connect with him. Can you stand up? Just uh, so he is a great, is uh, a great person. Um, about uh, how to bring young people in decision making. Um, in Europe, uh, we in the European Union, we have a program that, which is called Schumann Trainship where young people get the chance to spend f up to five months at the European Parliament and see how uh, decision-making you know, uh, processes work. You can also have the chance to work with, uh, with a member of the European Parliament. That's a, it's another uh, type of uh, and other type of activities. But I don't think, I'm not aware of any other programs like this in other uh, countries. But uh, this is a good, uh, a good practice uh, to, to share. About uh, uh, the youth um, governance uh, um, and the engagement of very young participants, especially gener Generation Z, uh, to internet governance related um, uh, spaces uh, with, uh, with a few other people, um, including uh, Stacy and Pirate. We have uh, co founded the Dynamic Teen Co Coalition, which is open to young people, uh, to teenagers aged 13 to uh, 19 years old. And uh, we try to, we want to try to engage teenager from a very young age to the internet governance space. This is, uh, I think, uh, the, um, the coalition was launched uh, yesterday. I was not there because I was on, on my flight. But uh, in the next year, we plan to do some activities, and we have already teenagers involved. Pirate itself is 14 years old, and uh, she is a great example of how uh, young people, like uh, teenagers, can can be um, can be um, how to say engaged. Yeah. I will leave the. Floor. I will try to keep it short, but we have we had lots of questions, and I just want to reflect a little bit uh, to a bit of everything. Um, really happy to actually see quite a lot of folks from Hong Kong. I am from Hong Kong as well, and after so many years, we're finally back in Asia Pacific, and we finally have more voices from Asia Pacific to uh, to to be in this global um, internet governance community. It's been a long time. Me myself being here for like five years, I think it is really good to see. Uh, you know, it's full of hue and colors in this room. And thank you so much for uh, uh, policymakers and private sectors, as, as well as the team that put together this uh, global youth summit uh, to make things happen. Because, I mean, embracing my our youth, this uh, probably don't have that diplomatic or political wisdom to be very careful on what we speak. Um, but thank you for being so open to listen to our opinion. Uh, but one big thing, as, as someone who works as a youth leader in this space, particularly for a program uh, that focused on building people's digital literacy in um, Asia Pacific, I think um, for some countries, uh, there are ways for us to get involved into policy making by participating in open consultation and all, but apparently not all the countries that do that. And ironically, from the place I come from, uh, I don't think we can uh, contribute to anything constructively. And so um, this is a space for us to just give our two cents, but how is it going to change, right? Um, this is very questionable. But um, in, in, you know, in an international level, and especially in internet governance, uh, I think one, one thing very important for us uh, to be able to be part of the policymaking process is to also have um, the capacity to be uh, to be policy literate. I don't know how to put it that because in uh, in order to contribute to legislation or policymaking process, you have to 
know about what is going on. We can't just go into a room telling uh, people uh, that they need to listen to young people. So I'm really glad for people of the previous generation to stay in this room to listen to us today uh, regarding all the, all the uh, comments that we just made. Um, I think um, I'm really, really glad that we are not shy to make our voice heard. And I believe this conversation does not end here because it is just an hour of a session. Um, and you probably, not everyone knows too much about the scenes in Asia Pacific probably, but we believe that young people should- Sorry, I hate to rush you, but- I will wrap up, that's my last <laughs> sentence. Young people would like to uh, contribute with substance and we should work hard on that in order to, um, in order to make our community here working. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. There was a question uh, that many youth are already connected and uh, as legislators, what are we doing to make sure that uh, most of them are, there's a risk on social media. So I think one of the issues that as the legislators uh, uh, do is to make sure that we, uh, the executive develops uh, digital literacy programs, especially for the youth uh, to make sure that uh, they uh, taught on how to use digital tools safely and uh, responsibly. Uh, so government has to make sure that they invest much in education and awareness campaigns so that uh, they can be able to inform uh, youth and uh, individuals as well as the public on the issues of online privacy and uh, cyber security uh, uh, best practices. What I believe is uh, an informed uh, public is better equipped to protect their digital identities. Uh, I think in conclusion, maybe I'll not be given time, I will just say that to recognize that the digital landscape is ever evolving. And uh, as policymakers, we have to regularly uh, review and update regulations to keep pace with the technological advancements and emerging threats. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, 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 thanks, uh, and, and lots of great questions. I had, wish we had a chance to address all of them more in depth, but I'll, I'll take a basket of them. A number of questions revolved around how do you get used voice heard, not just in the Internet Governance Forum, but in a lot of these decision-making uh, levels, and, and how do you have that multi-stakeholder approach? And, you know, I, I think it's not, this is a larger issue, right? We, 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 also talk, we always talk about multi-stakeholder involvement. And the reality is often far different than the mantra of saying multi-stakeholder over and over again. Actually having an impact makes a difference. Now, I've been a government stakeholder. I've been a non-government stakeholder. And I think we all realize it's a lot harder when you're not in the government to have the impact that you want to have. And that's true whether you're young or you're old or you're whatever age you are, whatever sex you are. So it can't just be a box checking exercise saying, oh, we've consulted the youth we had a forum here, we've consulted the youth, we're done. You know, we pat ourselves in the back, we say, okay, we've done a great job. It has to be meaningful, and I think that's a process. And it, I think it's not easy. There are uh, economic constraints and access constraints. That's also true uh, in the non-youth uh, area, too, for lots of folks. So how can we address this more meaningful and make sure that people have those access? And I think there's a couple examples. One, you know, all these open, when there are open consultations in your country, or there are ones that are international, it doesn't matter if you're young or you're old. If you're young, take advantage of those. Make your comments. Submit written comments if you can. Try to be part of that conversation. Try to group together to the extent you can, too. There's a program that we've been running uh, with a number of governments, uh, my organization, the Global Forum on Expertise, Cyber Expertise, for women diplomats, to get women in cyber, to get them to come to UN meetings. That's been very successful. More women have voices now. Maybe there should be a program like that, like was talked about in the Schumann Fellowship, that we should do for youth uh, to come to these meetings, to see where the sausage is being made to participate in these. So I think that's really important. Um, so those issues, I think, are really at the heart of everything else we've discussed. Just one other thing I'd say is someone asked the question of how do you make sure to protect youth without limiting their access to the, to the internet and to these tools? That's exactly the issue here. I think that you cannot, you know, in the name of protecting youth, limit their access so they don't have the ability to participate in all these different forms and see it. That's for policymakers to find the right balance, but that's where we really do, I think, need your input and help. So, so thank you for, for participating. And like everyone else said, great we meet every year here, great you're meeting nationally, but it's gotta be a more sustained conversation.
Thank you very much. <clears throat> and indeed, <clears throat> many, many interesting questions, so in, uh, impossible to tackle them all. Just a few points from my side. Um, what, <clears throat> what we've seen recently and what we are actively supporting, so uh, in practice and also financially, is a, a shift in paradigm from connectivity, you know, where people, this was the mantra of the last years or decades, where you know, everybody Sorry. should be connected <clears throat> to meaningful like connectivity, meaning that <laughs> It's not Sorry, sufficient that you have coverage. Um, you it also has to be affordable. Please. It's not sufficient that you can log on to the internet. You also need skills to actually do something uh, useful. And, and uh, other such uh, indicators. So this is called universal meaningful connectivity. And there's a session on this during the IGF uh, one of the next days. Um, oh, by the way, and that also means collecting data, of course, in, in all uh, you know, in the countries that participate, many in, in all UN countries around the world. Um, and then, of course, informing policy in those countries. So I think a lot of questions were about not only connectivity, but uh, other aspects of that. And so this is one way uh, that we're trying to have this paradigm shift towards a meaningful connectivity. The second point I wanted to make, which might also be you know, uh, of interest, is, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the Digital Services Act, a new uh, legal instrument in the EU, which really tries to be part of the answer to many of these questions. So we feel that industry isn't doing enough uh, on a voluntary or a self-regulatory basis. There have been all these questions about balance. <clears throat> and so in this act, uh, there is, I think, one of, I mean, the first um, serious approach to this uh, around the world <clears throat> that we are taking now. Um, maybe a few more things. So. Part of the answer in our, um, to also quite a few of these questions, uh, in our opinion, lies in education. So it is about education, it is about skilling. There's no uh, shortcuts, you know, no easy answers. Uh, it's, as some people said, it's, this is hard. Uh, you have to go through this, I mean, we. Uh, and so um, education is part of the answer. And uh, the concept of critical thinking. About participation, I think um, some people have already responded. Maybe last point is that yes, we, we are also completely in you know supporting as a European Union the concept of a free and open internet because we are seeing uh, since some years now, but this is not stopping potential um, shifts where we might end up with a fractured global so not a global internet anymore, but a fractured internet where access to information to free information itself is uh, is really under threat amongst amongst other things. But thank you. I'm not going to try to restate what was already said so brilliantly by my, my colleagues here. Um, so what I would say is just to encourage you all to continue to ask these questions, you know, and, and you're asking the right questions, you're identifying the right problems, you are challenging the right ideas. Uh, and, you know, to follow what, what uh, my colleague here, Peter, just said is, is really the idea of the open Internet and making sure that you have these forums, these avenues, this ability to say that uh, in a global universe and a global internet because otherwise, you know, we can't fix, these, these are not problems that are going to be fixed piecemeal. It does need to be addressed at a global level and we can only do that if we're all speaking on the same internet on the same, with the same voice. But it, I was really encouraged by, by seeing all of the engagement and all of the, the questions. You all ask very hard questions and I think it's important to continue to ask them. Um, yeah, I completely agree. Actually, the questions were incredible and something to ponder upon. Um, so great points by all the panelists. Uh, there are a couple of things that I'd I just like to highlight upon. I, there was a point around digital divide um, with uh, more emerging technologies coming in and there's more adoption. Uh, but let's look at it from a different lens, you know, leveraging emerging technologies for bridging the digital divide, for um, accelerating SDGs, um, give quality health care, quality education. So maybe that's also something we can uh, think about. Um, there was also a point around um, concern, rather, um, on how to decrease this gap between policymakers and youth, uh, meaningful youth inclusion. Um, from my experience, you know, working with young people through Youth IG of India, uh, we've no no noticed that a lot of young people um, are falling, um, are are concerned about the lack, of, you know, lack of understanding of the subject and this gap in terms of uh, awareness of the level at which the discussions are happening in the policy and tech forums. So that you know, results in lack of confidence, and that is something we're working towards through YIG, a fellowship program, and as well as at the annual forum, which is an intergenerational dialogue that builds in confidence and comfort for them to discuss such critical issues of importance, along with the decision makers. 
Um, now, with respect to um, amplifying the participation, there's also it's also important for young people to understand the relevance of their participation. Why is it important? And this is also something I think we should uh, look into uh, working upon. Um, there was a po point about um, young people, you know, we are seeing a lot of young people in this room in the IGF processes, or internet society also. There are lots of organizations that are meaningfully engaging young people. Uh, but something I've noticed is the multilateral bodies also, not just multi-stakeholder, are engaging young people. For example, the International Telecommunications Union has a Generation Connect initiative under the ITUD uh, vertical, where uh, they are looking at um, participation, empowerment, and engagement of young people. I'm part of the Generation Connect Visionaries Board, and we are not just looking at young people's involvement in the ITU processes internally, but also implementation of the UN Youth Strategy, making sure that young people are placed at an equal footing at various forums, platforms, and um, at the table along with the key decision makers uh, in the digital space. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This was a very rich intergenerational dialogue. I can't possibly sum it up, but it reminded me that a good friend told me once the difference between the online and the offline world is, in the offline world, it's the natives who make the laws and the immigrants have to abide by the laws. In the online world, it's the other way around. The immigrants made the laws and the natives have to support these laws and have to abide by these laws. But anyway, I think the message is clear. The room is clearly in favor of more youth empowerment and youth engagement. And what I retained was the importance of basic connectivity. Without connectivity, Without an open, global, and interoperable internet, we cannot have these discussions. So that is the very basics. And lastly, what Vint Cerf said right at the beginning, the importance also, which is not digital, but analog, use your brain. I think that was a very healthy reminder. But with that, I give to my co-moderator, Lily, to sum it up and to close the meeting. All right, so we are at the end of our session. And one of the things that came out of this is Essentially, our voices matter, and what you did here today for promoting the safe digital future is to bring to bear the things that hurt or affect us the most um, as youth. And we don't, like um, I said, was said before, we don't want to just be engaged and it, it, it ends there. We want to be continually invited and to follow just through to possibly um, some, see some changes and also implementation. We've seen how there's that struggle to be able to balance both privacy, security, and um, just making whatever we do online also open for people to, to use. And even Vincent mentioned that uh, as an open system or open space, there's that struggle that still exists. And what we want to do is to make sure that we are reminded continually on how to make sure that we create the space um, make it in such a way that's trustworthy that all of us can use and also leave it behind for future generation. Thank you for being an amazing audience and the time was, I mean, probably racing with us, but we've come to the end and we want the conversations to continue. Please meet any of our panel members to discuss further if your question wasn't answered. But before we go, we want to do a photo for all of us. So if you can, anyone on this stage, just run up, come stand somewhere. Feel, leave your seat, don't, don't feel like uh, you don't know somebody here. Just come back, come to the stage. Let's have a photo together and sum up our youth summit this year. Thank you so much for participating. <laughs> come everyone, find some space around the stage. Well, <laughs> oh well, yes, around the stage is fine also, so we don't collapse the stage. So around, squats in front, stand on it, but <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm.